Hey and welcome. Truth of Us is an audience supported podcast and an audience supported Substack as well. You can find me over there on Substack at official Brendan Murphy. And if you enjoy this work, please join the growing body of consciously evolving minds and voyage with us into forgotten and forbidden realms of knowledge. So do hit that like button, share with your fellow seekers. And if you haven't yet, please do consider becoming a paid subscriber, whether it's over on my Substack or through buying me a coffee right here via the podcast. Also, feel free to check out my private evolutionary accelerator, Evolve Yourself, over at evolveyourself.live for the free masterclass. And of course, I do invite you to join me in the members-only Truthiversity for all premium content, including part two of every podcast. See truthiversity.com for more information. Researching, writing, and podcasting is what I do full-time, so thanks in advance for your support. It does mean a lot to me. All right, ladies and gents, welcome to this episode of Truthiverse. This is season five, and we're kicking it off with Justin Leslie. And I'm going to read his bio because I, I think it, it, you know, I normally don't, I normally would avoid reading someone's bio, but I, I think in this case, it's uh, not a bad idea. And then, you know, this will give us a quick little overview. And uh, obviously then Justin's going to talk us through his story. He's a young dude. He's He's been through a lot in his, uh, in his life. Well, how old are you now? 26, 27? 26. Wow. Okay. So you've been through a lot of stuff <laughs> for a 26 year old. All right. Yeah. So, ladies and gents, let me give you a quick rundown of Justin, then we're going to flesh it out with this. This is going to be a very interesting talk. So, he is a living man, a scientist, a whistleblower, an investigative and undercover journalist, and a producer of the film Project Whistleblower. He worked directly on the COVID-19 Pfizer mRNA vaccine platform from March 2021 to April 2022. He worked with Project Veritas during his time at Pfizer for four months. Instead of being allowed to blow the whistle, CEO James O'Keefe offered Justin a job. This is where things get even more interesting, as you'll find out. Justin went to go to work at PV, Project Veritas, as a journalist, and he is the journalist behind the infamous Pfizer-directed evolution story, reporting that Pfizer is mutating, mutating COVID. <laughs> Justin will have more to say about that. As well as the fertility story, that's fertility, P-F-E-R-T-I-L-I-T-Y, on the impact the vaccine has had on menstrual cycles. And Justin went to work at O'Keefe Media Group for about five months, where he ended up resigning in August. And since August 2023, he has worked on the film that tells his story, which is called Project Whistleblower, which is a tell-all documentary of what his experience was inside the walls of Pfizer and also the alternative media world. Well, <laughs> mate. Mouthful, right? Thanks for that intro, Brendan. Appreciate it's it, brother. No, it's a pleasure, man. It's it's really great to have you here and um to give you a chance to to tell the story. And you know, I, I'll get to hear it. Obviously, I, you know, I've gotten to see a sort of advanced edition of the of the documentary, but um, you know, I, I'm going to enjoy hearing it from you directly as well. So, dude, um, let's 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 tell us let's tell the story. Like, where do you want to start with this thing? I, I really want. I mean, we can out. just we can start essentially. I mean, that was a that's a great intro, and I'm kind of you know doing these pre podcasts essentially to you know, have an outline of everything, but every, every talk is going to be unique. Right. And, um, basically I, you know, where the story starts, where the documentary starts, uh, is at the university of Rhode Island, right. Where I start off, uh, studying pharmaceutical and biomedical sciences. And so, you know, everyone calls colleges you know especially public universities nowadays like you know indoctrination camps right so i went and studied pharmacology and pharmaceutics pharmacokinetics pharmacokinet pharmacodynamics right whole nine yards of basically taking up my bachelor's and becoming a pharmaceutical scientist like a bench level introductory level to these pharmaceutical companies is essentially what i was going through so I mean, to even preface that and getting to why I wanted to get into pharmaceuticals is uh, stemming from when I was nine, 10 years old, I was diagnosed with a multi-system disorder called tuberous sclerosis complex, which creates benign tumors in just about every organ of the body. So I was diagnosed much later than most people are in their livelihoods. Like most people with this dis-ease, right? Because you know, we can talk about viruses and everything down the road, but in this story, right, I was diagnosed with a disease, right, and um, was essentially given a 26-page packet, right, from this guy from Yale, right, and, you know, it was this huge traumatizing event in my life of, like, 
being told that you're different, you have this disease with this really long name, you know, and I was just, it, it kind of sent me into a depression when I was younger, right? Because I was like, is something wrong with me? Did I do something to deserve this, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so then I discovered that I'm extremely lucky in that people with this dis-ease are rather debilitated, you know, like 90% of people with TSC is what it's called for short, have epilepsy and 40 to 60% have some version of autism, essentially. So it's a really disabilitating and debilitating disorder, right? So my drive and force to go into pharmaceuticals was to get into drug discovery or into pharmaceutical sales for, you know, rare disease and things of that nature, right? Because, you know, that's the machine that we're kind of fed, right? But I saw good in that, you know, I mean, I, I, I didn't see any harm in going to try and, you know, create a new drug that is going to actually cure the root cause of this, you know, rare disease that I was diagnosed with. Right. So, you know, I go to university of Rhode Island and, you know, it's, it's a great pharmacy program that I went through. Right. I mean, I, I learned a lot. Right. And, I liked pharmacology because it was essentially, you know, taking the drugs and seeing how it works within the human body physiology, right? And what's going on, you know? So it's kind of like reverse physiology in a sense, right? So um, I graduated URI in the midst of the COVID pandemic, right? Like when COVID, you know, quote unquote hit, right? I was on spring break literally in, you know, what was it, four years ago to like in two weeks, essentially, in the midst of March. And it was just, you know, I started asking questions right away. I, I I didn't think, oh, my gosh, this is a sham, right? But in that time, like, nobody really was prepared for, you know, a quote-unquote pandemic or plandemic, like I call it in the film, or scandemic, like you like to call it, right? Um, So, you know, from Fort Lauderdale, graduate do zoom university at university of rhode island for the last three or four months essentially and was pretty miserable doing that you know and i was like this is basically a waste of time right and then uh so i was applying to master's programs uh or i mean pretty much just Rutgers because i wanted to work with a professor Gabriella D'Arcangelo from Rutgers on my, you know, dis East, right? TSC. She had this massive research paper on like the mTOR C1 pathway involving TSC, right? So this is all prefacing, you know. And and so I took my Rutgers acceptance and said, hey, I'm gonna go to Rutgers because I couldn't find a job, right, out of school, you know, which was I mean, I was obvious, I, I was looking for a job, but I just couldn't find one, you know? And so, you know, once I started at Rutgers, it was Zoom University again, right? I didn't realize that until I already sent my deposit in and, you know, I thought I was going to be able to do research and stuff and, you know, stay on campus maybe, but they're basically saying, you know, you, you're, you're stuck doing this on the computer until the vaccines come out basically. And so, you know, I was already asking all these questions and researching into, you know, the COVID-19 fraud, essentially, right? But I was like one of maybe two people in my entire program that was actually questioning the narrative to, you know, like I have one friend from this program that I haven't even finished, right? Because, I mean, we, we'll get to that in the timeline. But so, you know, first semester was essentially like, m1 school like a master's m1 medical doctorate uh coursework essentially right studying all these biomedical pharm pharmacology again and you know not getting to the root cause of anything you know and i'm just like this is just regurgitating what i was doing at university of rhode island i'm not learning anything new and this whole thing literally seems like entirely questionable like i watched the documentary Plandemic 2. And so I wrote up this entire um, uncovering of a report, essentially, for my drug discovery class uh, for Dr. Dr. Welsh, 
who I thought was super cool. Like he was a really nice professor. Right. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to challenge the narrative as, as best as I could. Right. And literally, you know, watched Plandemic 2 and took all of the patents regarding, you know, everything shown in that film to like corroborate it. And then I put it into a paper and it essentially, you know, lines out the, the lockstep agenda that we were up against. Right. And so, I mean, it started with Carrie Mullis, uh, in the PCR test. Right. I mean, you know, all of us truthers and, you know, people that are, you know, have looked into this, understand that the PCR test ultimately is a sham and that, once you get up to 35, 40 cycles, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's a joke, you know, essentially that they use this test like they did back with, you know, the HIV AIDS, um, scam as well, you know, so and manufacturing cases. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was pretty absurd, you know? And so, I mean, I highlighted Carrie Mullis, uh, talking about how fat is a fraud essentially. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people can see it. It's he's literally called Fraud Chi, right? You know, is this nickname? Fausty. <laughs> you know, so yeah. um, there was Carrie Mullis, and then also highlighted um, Dr. Scott Jensen, who was a senator from Minnesota, um, where he literally was highlighting how you know he was encouraged to make covid deaths like written down even though you know if this person tested positive like two weeks you know if they find out that someone dies from a heart attack or some sort of pneumonia right but their son had you know covid two weeks prior or something like oh yep that's a covid death and it was just a huge a huge sham and incorporated that into the paper as well um and you know highlighting event 201 essentially how they talked about a coronavirus outbreak in october of 2019 right and like it just coincidentally happens like what four or five months later and you know that's kind of happening right now with disease x it seems like they're they're just buttering us with predictive programming for the people who you know, I mean, we're definitely way better prepared for something like a disease X, I think, mm -hmm. as in, in terms of humanity. Um, but there's still a lot of people who are going to fall for this narrative, potentially, which is why I'm, you know, doing what I'm doing and want to speak out about all of this, you know. Yeah. So that paper, you know, was part of my journey, part of my awakening process. Um, and then I was, like I said, completely miserable during my Rutgers master's program. And so I said, I'm going to find a job and utilize my skills as a scientist, right? Because if I'm this miserable, you know, why, why would I keep doing something that I'm not enjoying? So I pretty much just enrolled in one class instead of what it was, it was like five or six that I had to take, right? So I was just a part-time student. And so I applied to several pharmaceutical companies um, and, you know, I went through multiple interviews. Um, so it's not like I was, I was, I didn't even like reach out to Pfizer slash this Mindlance company, right? They called me, right? So Mindlance Incorporated it is a, a consulting firm that, you know, hires people for pharmaceutical companies, right? So, I mean, my LinkedIn was open and these people called me and said, hey, there's this role in and over Massachusetts, if you'd, uh, you know, if you want to apply, essentially, you know, they, they, they might hire you, right? They're looking for people. I'm like, oh, gosh, right? And so it, I wasn't even aware that I was going to be working on the vaccine until the interview itself, right? But I knew it was for Pfizer as a contractor, right? And so, you know, I look back to that first and even the second interview and it was, I mean, it was, it was professionally done, but it just, it felt like lackadaisical almost of like, I don't even feel like these people are going to hire me. Like these people have way, you know, they could totally hire somebody else. Right. Like there's no way that it's going to happen. Right. Like I thought it was kind of a joke, you know, and they, 
offered me the position after the second interview and it was literally just two phone interviews like they didn't even see my face they didn't know what i looked like and so you know i got the call from the recruiter saying they're offering you this position and i said you gotta be kidding me in my head <laughs> right because i just like i literally you know to even backtrack like when i was in this master's program like waking up to the vaccines and the dangers of them and essentially you know we're both friendly with alex zach like i was very much on the same train of like these vaccines are going to be mandated and like used for forced vaccines forced vaccination like this is you know this lockstep agenda you know all these vaccine passports and everything right like i was on that wavelength i just you know i wasn't all over social media speaking out about it because i was doing what i was doing so you know i essentially said i need to uh really think about this when i got that phone call and i said i'll basically call you back tomorrow and i had 24 hours and the guy was kind of shocked that i didn't take the job initially right um and you know one of the questions i was asking is do i have to get vaccinated right like yeah. Because I basically said there's no way in hell that I'm going to, you know, if if it's this job or getting the vaccine, like I'm I'm going to wait, you know, that's basically what I said to this recruiter. And so he found out for me and he said, yeah, it's not mandated yet. And so I said, OK, <laughs> right. So at the 23rd hour that next day, I took the job and and I basically, you know, with no intentions of having a vendetta or anything like that right it's literally just i'm gonna go see this for myself and see like what it looks like and see what this vaccine looks like see who these people are like and just learn and use my skills for my undergraduate degree right um so you weren't yeah. of a mindset at this point you weren't sort of like of, of that undercover mindset going into something to expose a fraud or it was something dangerous you were just kind of like curious at this point I was very curious and I knew that inserting myself into the company would allow me to expose something down the road. Absolutely. I mean, like, cause there are receipts like in the documentary of like, I reached out to project Veritas like prior to even accepting this offer. And they're like, yeah, we can't tell you what to do, but if you find something that's newsworthy, right, feel free to reach out to us. So you know, I was already, I was thinking like that, but I mean, it wasn't my like dead set intention of like, I'm going to blow the whistle. Like essentially, you know, I've, I didn't say that like to myself specifically, like, Hey, I'm good. I'm going to go, you know, undercover essentially. Like I kind of was just like, let's see, you know, if that opportunity essentially comes from this. Right. Um, so I took the job, I moved to Boston and it was March of 2021, right? So boosters were almost kind of already coming into people's arms, right? Most people were double jabbed that were going to be double jabbed, right? So I had no way of like stopping people from taking the vaccine, uh, those two, those two first shots, right? But when I go from March 2021, essentially, till I reached out to Project Veritas in uh, late September is when they officially started working with me and like actually communicating with me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I was living in, you know, you could call it two different matrices, right? Like I was at work pretending literally no one knew my vaccine status. They all just assumed, right? Um Right. And, and they were like, even telling me, yo, go get the booster, Justin. Right. And I'm just, I'm like, this is insane, you know, because in real time, like I was paying attention to, you know, alternative news media of like all the myocarditis happening and pericarditis and just vaccine injuries in general, right. Like Guillain-Barre syndrome. And so, you know, it really pains me to have been in the know you know like i feel so guilty right like and and people have told me like yo this isn't your fault right but i you know hold the weight of the world on my shoulders and feel like that there's blood on my hands right because i knew between right and wrong and that this was ultimately harming people you know so 
but I, I can't go back and create a time machine and, you know, do things differently. Like this is, this is how it's all played out, yep. you know? And I think it, it seems like it played out, you know, you weren't in a position to do it at that point and it played out the way that it, it needed to so that you would be put in certain positions to then, you know, ultimately when, when the time was right, you would be enabled to to do that, to do your thing. Absolutely. So I had reached out to Project Veritas um, in, I think it was late August, and I had a phone call with one journalist and, you know, she was just asking me questions and basically didn't think that what I had to offer was worth it. And then I basically kept hitting them up. I hit them up in early September. And then after Jody O'Malley, who is the HHS, HHS whistleblower, she had a really, you know, bombshell story out of Arizona, right, where she was recording in her hospital. And there was a doctor, I believe her name is Dr. Gonzalez, said a lot about the virus. Uh, system and the fraud and essentially said that you know the government doesn't want the vaccine or like basically getting out there that the vaccine is full of shit right so i was like this story is crazy you know so her story really like drew me to reaching out to them again you know and showing that hey like i'm holding a picture of these vials like i want help you know mm -hmm. is all i really wanted you know i'm like i'm in this position what can I do? You know? And so like the very next day or two, right. I mean, I sent that email and then I got on the phone with the journalism team that, uh, worked with me. Right. And then, so they provided me cameras. Right. And I started, you know, obtaining information immediately, you know? And so, so you know, just to be super explicit, uh, like clear for people, you were going into work, you were going to your job at Pfizer, like wired up, basically like re ready to record footage and, and f that would be. Used. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, basically what I would do is cut off a button on this shirt, right. And put in this, you know, put in the camera and start rolling, you know? And so, you know, it's really, um, it was, it was crazy what was happening. You know, I was like, I'm this undercover agent now inside Pfizer. Right. And, you know, I'm working with this journalism team who has their hands literally all over me, like helping me. Right. And I was this unwitting whistleblower, like pretty much, you know, stupid, naive, but like brave at the same time. I was like, I got to do this for the world. You know, like, that's how I felt. I'm like, I don't care if someone takes me out at this point. Like, I'm I'm going to do this, you know, because this is what God's telling me to do. And this is what feels right to do, right, is work with the, this group of people, right? So I was very trustworthy, but very naive, right? Because, you know, I was going in there every day, obtaining information, and then, you know, giving it all to them in this trustworthy sense you know, that they're going to take this and run with this massive story, right? And it's not like I wasn't obtaining nothing. You know, I was like, in in the documentary, my my old manager, Conwall, who is a very nice lady, um, she was essentially talking about how the Pfizer CEO, Albert Borla, and Uger Sahin, uh, the BioNTech CEO, essentially had no idea like what was going on right and i was eliciting information out of her um by just talking about vaccine symptoms and you know how the mrna is you know like this is an emergency use drug and like why are we you know pushing boosters on people right in in this country but you know the other countries haven't even gotten their two shots yet right just basic stuff and she she gave like a bunch of newsworthy content essentially you know and um you know to outline anything else i mean i can see if i can pull up the rest of the transcript but i mean what she says about albert borla is really damning in my opinion um oh, she also talks about katherine jensen essentially um 
speaking with Uger Sahin, the Biontech CEO, right? Because what what happened is, you know, when I got into Pfizer, I discovered that they were already working on mRNA vaccine projects for flu before COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Before COVID even existed, apparently, they were working on this in 2018 and 2019, right? And so the problem is, you know, and if you look into Moderna, Moderna is literally like a project slash company, you know, created by DARPA, right? The military, right? So Moderna went like 10 years being a company without being able to put up a project, a actual product, right? Because they were strictly... Moderna is mod RNA, literally, like, in in esoterica, right? Like, you can move the words around, and it's it's mod RNA, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what their product and projects were. And so Conwell goes on to even say, like, you know, we, as in Pfizer and Moderna, were using this mrna platform during the emergency use authorization of this covid19 scamdemic that we have come to see in order to get through it now is the quote essentially so you know to get through what the pandemic or get through you know the crazy symptoms that happen from these mrna injections right so you know I thought it was pretty ridiculous that this was a conversation I was happening while in real time Pfizer was reporting like get your booster the vaccines are 100 percent safe and effective this this and that right like you go back to the news cycles and see what was said it was different from what was being told to me right so I was I thought I was doing the right thing still, right? Like I'm I'm traumatized, literally. So that was October 6th. And then if we want to stay with the timeline of everything, um, I provided uh, vials to the team, right? I, I said, you know, I started seeing things like about people glowing on alternative media websites like BitChute and, and, um, it's linked to this enzyme called luciferase, right? And so, you know, this whole uh, moment in time has also, you know, brought me closer to God and looking into the Bible. And, you know, I'm not a religious guy, I'm more of a spiritual guy. Like, I, I and I like using scripture um, for spiritual reasons, right? And, you know, just hearing, the word luciferase it's it's very esoteric in in regards to what was happening at the time right like if this thing's p making people glow right and you're hearing about you know this you know this is being mandated and you're not going to be able to go into grocery stores or you're not going to be able to travel like just ripping away your rights as a man or a woman right but that's not the reality of the world that we live in, right? We have to stick up for our rights and stand up for our rights as men and women. You know, we can't let the so-called authority tell us what is right and wrong, right? We are supposed to be their uh, authority, I suppose, right? So okay. um, little tangent there, but yeah, so I I discovered luciferase in in uh, research studies and things of that nature and in animals, right? So, you know, seeing that I'm like, oh, this people are glowing on on the internet. Um, something seems incredibly wrong. And then you know, hearing about graphene oxide and that potentially being in the vials and the vaccines, right? And and um, you know, I just wanted to get to the bottom of what was happening, right? Like I was probably the only critical thinker that Pfizer employed during this entire thing, you know, <laughs> sounds about right. <laughs> or one of, you know, I'm sure that, I mean, there were other people, I think that were not vaccinated because I mean, I had to ultimately go to work. Like I complied for a little bit and essentially taking this PCR test. It wasn't one that went up my nose. I essentially just had to spit into a cup. So they have my DNA basically, right? So there's probably like a, you know, we can joke about this, but there's probably a 
clone of me already. <laughs> An obedient, compliant Justin. Well, yeah, so I complied with that, but I mean, I was like, there's no <clears throat> way I'm taking this vaccine, you know, um, and um, sorry, we're tangent off of the whole vial story, but to finish up the how I got out of getting vaccinated even is um, my contracting company worked with me versus my colleagues. Anyone who's considered a Pfizer colleague was, you know, their manager saw their vaccine status, literally, right? So my manager didn't have access to mine because I was just a contract employee. So I was just dealing with one person from outside the company, right? And when they told me about this mandate, that was coming and that I had to get vaccinated. I was like, dude, I'm going religious exemption and you can literally like kick rocks, right? Like if you try and make me get this, I'm going to sue you, you know, is, is what we're going to get into. And, and so they never questioned that after that. Right. So, you know, I stuck up for myself. Right. But for all the other colleagues it was definitely an interesting point in time right because i mean no one necessarily like put this thing in your arm you kind of you know you had to stick up for yourself and you know if if it meant walking away from your job it, that's what it ultimately was leading to right so there's class action lawsuits and everything happening from all of the the mandates and um you know the the tyranny that we saw during that time period right um but yeah i'll finish that tangent and so back to the the vile situation right with carrie midday um you know i provided the veritas team with you know this product the drug product and and we went all the way down to Mamaroneck, New York, and Carrie Midday was there. I recognized her from Stu Peters, right? She went on the show, um, you know, probably just that week prior, right? So I was super excited to see her. I was like, oh, this lady knows what she's doing, right? And so, you know, literally she brought the Johnson & Johnson and Moderna vials that she had already pre-examined from another show that she was on, but... This whole thing was going to be part of a massive expose of, you know, look at what's in the microscope or what's under the microscope, right? And so, you know, Johnson and Johnson and Moderna, she looked under those first because the we literally had the Pfizer vials were frozen, right? The entire way down, right? We made sure that they stayed a certain temperature. And so they had to thaw. And so we just looked at the Johnson and Johnson and Moderna. The Johnson and Johnson specifically looked different from Moderna and Pfizer, right? Moderna and Pfizer pretty much looked identical. Pfizer might have looked, you know, you were, were splitting hairs here, but they basically looked very similar, if not the same, right? Johnson and Johnson had these like black discs all over the place. And so, you know, I, I'm just wondering like what the heck is this like what is going on this does not look normal or real or like something that should go be going into people's arms ultimately right like this this seems like a bioweapon right is immediately what i'm thinking and on the Stu peters show there's you know a black disc and then there's this little parasite that even like swims around the black disc right so you know, as a 23 year old kid, young man, right, working on this, on on one of the vaccine projects, right, I wasn't working at J&J, &J, but to have seen what I was witnessing, right, I didn't even know what to think. All I knew is that this was a horrible crime against humanity, ultimately, right. And so we did Johnson and Johnson for whatever, like 20, 30 minutes, probably moved to Moderna and then moved to Pfizer. And, you know, if you watch the Stu Peters expose with Carrie, um, she provides pictures of the vials and, you know, what she took from that night. And so there's the talks of, 
like Tesla phoresis essentially and these carbon nanotubules that are being formed in people, right? Like essentially the way I look at what this vaccine is, is it's some form of a drug delivery system that is going into people and like forming these clots that we're seeing, right? These very unique blood clots that have started since the vaccine rollout, not since COVID happened, right? Unprecedented was, since the vaccine rollout, absolutely. Right. So, I mean, I'm not here to fear monger people, right? Like that is not the goal of this whistleblowing situation because, you know, my goal is, you know, just to really get to the bottom of what happened, right? And it, it probably can't be done by just me alone, right? But speaking out about this stuff, as somebody who worked at Pfizer on the vaccine, I I hope that people will listen and hear what I have to say and plead for a massive investigation into these shots, right? I mean, it's 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 crazy what i was witnessing right so um yeah i mean dr carey goes on to talk about how you know in the show it's potentially hydro vulgaris right and i'm not backing that these vials had like this water parasite essentially called hydro vulgaris right which is like a it's like a it's got to do with the transhumanism agenda where you know organs and limbs like regrow themselves like lizards kind of I'm not backing that up, right? But I'm not saying I don't even think Carrie will back that statement anymore. Ultimately, I think yeah. you know, it's kind of been debunked, but we can narrow down that in regards to the way that the patented technology of these drug delivery systems and then the ingredients of the vaccines, right, are lined up pretty much perfectly, right? So you have these lipid nanoparticles, AOC, AOC 0315, right, and Pfizer, and then Moderna's SM102, right, and these all have to do with this, this drug delivery system, ultimately, that leads to, you know, the clotting of these heavy metals in, in people. And, you know, I'm no expert at really explaining this, but I've done a lot of digging and research into it, and... um Dr. Anna Melhalja from uh she's from the end of COVID and I've I've watched all the end of COVID uh series for like the mRNA injections, right? So Dr. Anna Melhalja and then uh Dr. Anna Maria Oliva mm -hmm. uh both had very interesting sessions and I I see a lot of truth in both of them, but you mm -hmm. know, with um, Dr. Anna Maria Oliva, I think her session really does a good job at not necessarily fear mongering, yeah. right? In explaining that what is in these vaccines is nothing that's necessarily new, yeah, right? It's which is true, right? It's just you know, the way that she was able to outline how there is graphene in saline already, right? Like mm -hmm. on a and, Graphene's basically in everything at this yeah. point, you know. It's so, <laughs> right. So, that's that's the whole thing about this fear mongering of graphene oxide and everything. Uh huh. Yeah. So, and can I, if if you don't mind, brother, like hold that thought, and I want to let you keep going. Um, I, I I'm I've got Anna Maria Oliva living like two k's down the road from me with, and we've got Adam Bugelson in town as well. So. Yeah. I've had the benefit of like learning from these guys and, you know, Adam's like the godfather or the son of the godfather of, you know, holographic blood. And it drives him crazy when people talk about um, Anna Melseya because she is in some respects, I won't say all, as you, as you know yourself, in some respects she is, she's got a number of things quite wrong. Um, and, and it drives him crazy because he's like, look, she's pointing at a hologram here in the blood and saying it's graphene oxide. And then I'm like, you're right. This is okay. This is a hologram. And she doesn't know because she's very inexperienced with a microscope. And then what I really like with Anna Maria Oliva, 
is, and this is why I interviewed her as well for the podcast, and I called it Truth Is It's Time to Get Off the Fear Carousel, because she's, like you said, really good at explaining a bigger, broader picture where it, we take away the unnecessary fear and just kind of get a bit of perspective on it. Like you said, graphene's everywhere now. It's not new in, you know, we've not been able to prove it's in any uh, of the injections, but it's it's definitely in the environment everywhere, and it has been for for quite a while. So I just want to interject that, like, when we're talking about microscopy, what I've learned from Adam is... Uh, people need to be quite cautious with what they're seeing. Other people make claims about because you don't necessarily, we don't know what their level of expertise or experience might be. And then, you know, I finally meet with Adam and talk to him and, you know, I've spoken many hours with him and I kind of get now where he's coming from and why he finds it so frustrating when people are like, Adam, you know, I said this. And it's like, uh, <laughs> it's like, it's a hologram. Yeah. Stop it. It's a hologram. You know, like, so there's this interesting mix of we have to be discerning and, and figure out like, and most people are not in position either to, to like have the expertise to go, oh, well, that's right. But that's not right. That's, they, they just see, see a doctor and they go, well, they must know what they're talking about. Um, So, okay. Yep. Like whatever you say kind of thing, you know? Absolutely, brother. And I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger saying like Dr. Anna is, you know, doing this on purpose, right? No, and the, no. the fear mongering and everything. It's just, I mean, I've looked into it and, and I mean, her and I forget his name, but I mean, it's, it's not important, but they essentially treat these slides with oil. Um, and it just, it distorts the sample ultimately, you know? So, um, this was just one night of my life, right? But it was a nightmarish event ultimately right with dr carrie and looking at these vials and you know i mean it really was nightmarish brennan right like i mean there were these you know shards and and you know things that were moving in the j and j vial and like things that look like water parasites right and you know it's it's just i felt at the time like hey this is uh really not looking good for pfizer right like this looks this looks like a huge, huge mistake. And like, what am I even watching? You know? So, you know, we walked, we looked at the vials for like four something hours, I think, and it was getting late. So I had to go to bed. Right. And so, you know, they propped me up in a hotel. Right. I hardly slept because, you know, I didn't know what I was looking at, you know? And, you know, so, I woke up at like four o'clock that next morning to go to work, right? And and continue working on this vaccine that I just saw was like moving around and had this Tesla phoresis stuff and and you know these things that look like spider webs and this neural network essentially that Carrie Madey describes. Can right? I ask? Can I ask before you before you go on with the story there? When you go, when you're going to work at Pfizer, what what is your like brief or job description? What are you working on there? So I I was hired as an analytical formulation scientist, right? So I was working um for the pharmaceutical research and development team. It's called PHRD, right? So we had a relatively small team, right? And it was a small scale environment, right? So we just we really had like one lab to ourselves, right? We had like three benches, right? Um and I was given the role, you know, to get trained up on uh, some analytical drug assays, right? So there's ribogreen, which is a fluorescence assay, um, fragment analyzer, HPLC, which I wasn't really doing, um, analysis of like visual analysis, like just looking for, you know, against a black wall, right? Mm -hmm. Like, analyzing if there's any threads or things like that in the vials right so um but it was mainly ribogreen and fragment analysis uh were what i was doing a lot of right and it took me a decent amount of time to fully get trained it took me like four months to really become competent right first job out of college and i just you know not that i wasn't working i just you know, to be like fully competent, it took me a while, you know? What, so, 
Yeah, and in the context of like in the context of the vaccines, you know, the Pfizer was working like, you know, you're working on the rubber green and, and the other thing. What does that mean in terms of the context of the vaccines? Um, in regards to like what the manufacturing process and like how close I was to like the actual finish. Yeah, product. yeah. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to yeah, pull all that together and paint a picture for because the lay lay people, you know, those terms aren't gonna mean much. <laughs> so the best way that I will I'll do my best in describing it is I was in research and development. So I wasn't working directly on like a manufacturing building, right? Uh -huh. So I wasn't working on finished drug product. I was working on research, right? So we had a fabrication team, right? Which their job was essentially to make small scale batches, right? Of whatever projects they were working on at the time. Right. So, you know, you have all of these stability studies, right, with COVID-19, right, in the midst of the, you know, scamdemic, right, you have to ha show all of the stability and show, you know, mRNA integrity, mRNA encapsulation, show the concentration of what's in these vials, right? So, you know, there was apparently certain mRNA contents in each one, right? So, I would run a ribogreen assay, say, once a month for a stability study, right? Or run, you know, if if it was like a new formulation, say that they were testing, it would literally just be run the ribogreen, run the fluorescence assay, which is able to test for the percent encapsulation and test for the concentration of the, the vials, right? So does that make sense? I think nice. so. So all of this work was all focused around vaccine formulation? Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. So vaccine formulation, new stuff, and then stability for formulations as well, right? Okay. So like we had, you know, the vaccine was already going into people's arms, right? So we were continuing from an analytical perspective, looking at, you know, the shelf life of the COVID vaccine, right? And we would even do it at certain temperatures right we would you know minus 80 it was like minus 20 two to eight degrees right that all these different temperatures for it was mostly the new formulations but i mean they did stability for basically everything they had to cover every aspect of you know being a scientist right that's what you do you test out all the all of these temperatures which and i also thought it was really ridiculous that we were working with freezers that went up to minus 80 degrees celsius right i'm like what drug product needs to be frozen like this you know that that was just something i was always asking you know so um yeah so does that answer that answer your question yeah right? yeah thanks man i, I don't want to hop on it but i just yeah. want to kind of paint a picture of what was going on there on you know on the daily for you and in, in the context you were operating in yeah i mean i was in the lab like most days and it was essentially like small scale manufacturing so that it could be ramped up to something that's much larger right because you know i wasn't working with like bioreactors and things of that nature right which those things are huge huge tubes right that you know i don't even really know how they work but i know that they're big massive tubes right and that you know they hold a ton of drug product and that's that's that that's what manufacturing really has a lot to do with you know so small scale stuff i was only dealing with like vials and tubes essentially and we just threw everything out for the most part right so yeah the whole vial thing happened with carrie um and you know back to going back to work i continued on right doing what i was doing right obtaining information on the inside right and so um, I continued, say, talking to, um, in the film, Ramin Davari is featured, who is uh, my manager's leader figure, uh, her boss, right? And he is a formulation scientist. And so one day I was talking to him in the lounge area, and it was just me and him um, in this open space. And I just started asking him from a real world situation that you know, my mother 
had a friend who knew somebody else, right? Like her mother's therapist friend is, I think, what I say in the quote, but bringing up how somebody died essentially from a booster shot, right? Yeah. And he addresses how the only booster shot on the market right now is Pfizer, right? And then he basically deflects off of, well, correlation does not equal causation. People die every day, right? Like you can take the vaccine and they get run over by a car, essentially. It's what his deflection was. And I mean, I was I was probably the only person in my building and probably on the Andover campus that really was like it felt like asking these questions of you know, like people are dropping dead, right? Like and we're just rolling out this experimental vaccine and it's basically a worldwide clinical trial. Like, what is going on? You know? And uh, and, and he didn't seem to be thoroughly enjoying that conversation. There's only a short clip of it. I remember seeing, I remember you asking him that question and I hear, hearing his voice go, ah, but people die every day. It sounded like he really wasn't open to pursuing that on any level. No, yeah, and I think that's because he just didn't want to incriminate himself, right, in in any sense, right? Because, I mean, he was one of the head honchos of <laughs> this vaccine and how the formulation played out, right? So, um, yeah, it it's – I was eliciting him on safety issues and um, for him to essentially say that it's not our job to – worry about like the clinical aspect right he's like the clinical people that's their job to worry about like adverse events and people dying right and then he goes yep there was zillions of reports every day right and you know i wish i could go back and be like zillions what exactly do you mean by that like millions billions right to get an exact definition right but to say that Pfizer is getting zillions of reports every day on this vaccine uh, and having adverse reactions to it was very telling, you know, that well, he kind of did something. Yeah, you, yeah, you've got him on video saying it. I remember that. He, that is what he said, zillions of reports. And then later in the conversation, we were talking about, he, he refers to a chip company analogy. Um <laughs> which I also thought was really interesting. And so did Barrett's production team. They thought it was an interesting quote because he takes the chip company analogy, right? And starts explaining how, you know, as a chip company, or so I listed him on vaccine mandates, essentially. I was like, well, does Pfizer get mad when companies don't mandate the vaccine, right? And he's like, well, as a chip company, right? Aren't you, do you, do you, do you get mad when people talk bad about your product? Of course. Right. Like, and he's like, it's the same thing. Like, and then he goes on to explain how the vaccine is even manufactured for me to, or not the, in the metaphor, it's chip companies create chips for me to keep eating chips. Right. So he's like, basically the same thing. Like it's for me to take it again. Right. And then he even alludes to, that if you eat too many chips, you get heart problems and then you die. But nobody's talking about that. And so, you know, I, in the moment, right, was kind of shocked, right? And I wish I continued asking him more about like, oh, the chip company, is that actually like what pharmaceutical companies do too, right? But it's damning enough where, you know, the public should have the right to know this information that this is coming from, the mouths of leaders on the vaccine, right? So, you know, it was it was really absurd, right? And the next thing, essentially, that I believe is depicted in the film is uh, with Nick Warren, who is the Pfizer vice president, who he spoke at the um, childhood vaccine approval for 5 to 11-year-olds. Right. And so I was already like full blown entrenched into, you know, doing what I was doing with was with, you know, Project Veritas as a source. Right. And so, you know, I essentially set up a meeting with Nick. Right. Because, I mean, these people were open to having these conversations and answering questions, especially as a young, young guy, like 
new to the company, I really, you know, came across as this curious fellow, right? And so, excuse me, um, Nick essentially explained to me within the first five minutes of asking him after this advisory committee happened, right? I took all of these notes from this advisory committee and there were a lot of difficult questions that were asked by this board, ultimately linking, you know, the scenario is it's like this bait and switch situation, right? Where um, people in the truth community were or have heard of that term essentially, right? Where, you know, one drug gets approved, but they're really putting something else in people, right? There's the emergency use authorization and then there's the approved comirnaty, right? So my understanding of all of this is that with this childhood vaccine that was five to 11 years old, they did the clinical trials for five to 11 year olds with a buffer system that used PBS sucrose, right? So that storage temperature was at minus 80 degrees Celsius, right? So listening to this whole meeting, essentially, I'm listening to people in the FDA and Pfizer essentially say, yeah, there, there wasn't any clinical data done for this shot that was approved, right? The one that has this TRIS buffer, right? So the FDA and Pfizer essentially colluded and said, you know, we're going to allow a bioequivalence metric for this TRIS buffer approval, even though all of the clinical data is coming from a different storage temperature and a different formulation, ultimately. I mean, the, the formulation itself is the same up until the last step of the storage buffer system, right? So, you know, I saw that as fraudulent. Like, how are you not going to do actual clinical data on stuff that's going into people's arms, right? This junk that's going into people's arms. You should at least do clinical studies to show that this one is safe and effective, right? Going into the lingo of, you know, we all we know that all vaccines are bioweapons essentially at this point. But, yeah. you know, I'm... I'm speaking in terms of the actual lingo of what was going on, you know? So does that make sense? What, what I'm saying, how they literally used a different buffer system, but you know, the storage temperature was PBS minus 80. Right. And then the tris sucrose would, could be stored at a much um, higher temperature around like zero or two to eight degrees Celsius. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was much colder or not colder, so warmer, <laughs> yeah. right? So um, he essentially told me he gamed the FDA within like five minutes of sitting down with him, right? By lying by omission, right? He essentially didn't really address that the clinical data was for, you know, was, was omitted, right? For this approval, you know? So it, to me, it was bombshell. It was criminal and it was dangerous, insane that you know people can essentially you know talk about this behind closed doors and then have it approved for five to 11 year old kids and have it go into people's arms like this is an attack like it's child abuse it's it's an attack on kids you know and like that's ultimately why i have i i feel i have to do this is to do this for future generations right like this is something that i cannot just let go by you know like i don't know how else i'm supposed to explain that but um yeah i mean and, uh, and and just before you do go on um if you want if, if ladies and gents you're wondering um uh justin has all this you know the great quotes and conversations that he's talking about he's recorded footage he's got the footage and the audio in the documentary so I do recommend you see it so you can, you know, process all this with the visual aid and the audio and actually watch these people just completely essentially ex expose and out themselves, these crooks in Big Pharma. Absolutely. Um, and then, I mean, even in that same uh, approval meeting, Steve Kirsch, who I'm friendly with, you know, and we can talk about Steve after this, but, um, you know, he, Steve definitely backs up the virology narrative and, 
he like loves the directed evolution story that I did. That's how we became friends. But um, yeah. Steve did a tremendous job in the in the vaccine approval meeting as a speaker, it, lining out like people are dying from this. Like you, if you approve this, you are all criminals essentially. So I found that to be you know a pat on the back for him, right? In the sense of these people were notified that this was essentially a bioweapon, a death shot, a clot shot, whatever you want to call it, by right? whatever nickname you want to call it. That's what was going on. And there was mounds of evidence that Steve presented in, in that uh, expose, right? He had three minutes and he's basically just like, boom, next slide says what he has to say next slide. Right. And, you know, so it's very interesting stuff. Um, yeah. if people want to go back and rewatch all of this, right? Um, so where where to next in in the story? Um, Nick Warren happens, and then so I ended up meeting James O'Keefe on December third of twenty twenty one, right? Um, and uh, don't let me jump ahead too far. Um, after the microscope thing went viral with Carrie Midday. Um, about two weeks later is when this FBI raid happened on Project Veritas, right? And so I was still, you know, a whistleblower source, right? Obtaining my all of the information every day on what happened, right? And I mean, Stu Peter's video with her pretty much, you know, you could call it viral, right? It, 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 in a year's time, I mean, over a million people saw it. So, you know, it enough people saw it where it's, you know, uh, a high amount of people, right? So I knew it was rumored and she literally says like Project Veritas and a Pfizer whistleblower have essentially, you know, corroborated the story and, you know, wait for that essentially is what she says. And it just never gets released right and so the fbi raid happened november 4th and 6th um on eric cochran spencer meads james o'keefe on the 6th and i just it all felt like a huge coincidence uh that like didn't line up like it had to do with this ashley biden diary situation right which was also a story that wasn't published right and you know, I was just like, there's no way that Project Veritas is getting raided by the FBI. And like, why is they raiding the FBI? And I'm involved with PV trying to expose this massive fraud with the vaccine, ultimately, you know? So I'm just asking these questions and it took me a while, but like it ultimately, you know, I will say that it feels like it was a massive cover up to shut me up ultimately, you know, and scare the absolute shit out of me, you know? So that happened. And then, um, moving down the line, right? Like I was still doing what I was doing, you know, obtaining. This, information. And, sorry, man. Yeah. Uh, at this point in time, were you, were you already having doubts about James O'Keefe at this point or that come a little later? A little bit. It started, I started questioning it a little bit like the FBI raid happened. And I, I, yeah, like I watched live, like, cause I watched live. Like I was watching Fox news, like with my dad and my brother, believe it or not. And James was on Fox news with Sean Hannity and his lawyer. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about this Ashley Biden raid. And I was just watching this and I'm like, dude, this is crazy <laughs> because my family didn't even know what I was doing. You know, like they had no idea. Right. I was like on a one man mission to, you know, find out the truth of all of this. And I'm just like, is this because of what I did? You know, like, is this because of me ultimately? Right. And I mean, I wasn't like James is a fraud. Right. Because of all this. But, you know, it's just one of the dominoes of this whole story. Right. Is that kind of a yeah, yeah, like I, I, don't, I don't want to jump too far ahead. I want to let you kind of get there on your own time. So, yeah. Keep oh, you're going. good. You're good. So, no, but that that's a great question. I mean, it it's definitely one of the little dominoes that started as having me, like, ask 
these questions ultimately of like, is this completely controlled? Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the FBI raid happens. I still am working on the inside and, um, I met James December 3rd of 2021 at, uh, the Capitol grill in Hartford, Connecticut. And I was accompanied by, uh, several of the journalists that I was working with. Right. So there was Nightingale, Jitsu and security, right? Those are their code names. And um, I had actually had a phone call with Jitsu and Nightingale or Jitsu, who was the field ops director and like had his hand essentially in like every investigation um, as well as night. And then I think security and maybe a one James Lalino. Um, we all had a phone call like two days before I met James and they basically broke the horrible news to me that like your story is not going to be published, but James wants to meet you essentially. And like he even brought up employment initially, right? Like they, they thought I was so good at this undercover work that, you know, and they knew I didn't want to work at Pfizer anymore. So they're like, you can come help us essentially. Right. So you know, they dropped that suggestion. Right. And I'm just like, well, I could, right. You know, like, why not? Right. Like I do have all this blood on my hands from working on these vaccines. Right. So, you know, it was automatically like a really difficult decision. Right. And so, you know, they're like, yeah, 98% chance you're not, we're not going to release this because of the whole FBI raid. And then because of, you know, Massachusetts, uh, recording consent laws and everything. And, which I had no idea about, right? I really didn't. And, you know, so I sat down with James. He basically explains to me that I can't release your story. He starts showing me his wrists of like how he was arrested by the FBI. And I pleaded with this man saying, dude, you have to understand that like I've worked so hard as a whistleblower source for you and to string me along for three months, right? To just pull the rug on me, like, out of nowhere and then you know break my heart say that you can't release my story and then offer me employment right he offered me a job and i was i didn't know what to think right but like at that point it, it was all out of my hands it's not like i was keeping this stuff i was way too trustworthy naive and just here you go you know like this is the whistleblower story of the century here you go like let's do this and it just didn't they said no you know like sorry but we're not sorry ultimately like and you know james was the final say but you know the legal team apparently had their hands all over this journalist team that was working with me they knew every step of the way what i was doing so to allow all of that to play out and then pull the rug on me, it just felt like the it was, you know, something out of my control at that point. And I just was devastated, you know, because I literally walked out of that restaurant knowing that I had a massive story on a crime against humanity that couldn't, that wouldn't see the light of day, essentially. So... I stayed at Pfizer for four more months, right? Trying to essentially even, you know, at that point I was like, all right, I'll go apply to these other Pfizer campuses to see if I can do it again, you know? But I knew how powerful the information that I had obtained was, mm -hmm. right? I knew that, you know, like, and that is a huge reason why I've, you know, gone about what I'm doing, you know, gone about what is what is what, right? And what I'm doing, you know? So I resigned from working at Pfizer in uh, April. Mid-April was about when I was resigned, right? I think the exact day was April 12th of 2022, right? So basically a whole year is how long I worked there. And I was miserable that entire time, right? Like I, I you know, and I still look at it in a sense that I have blood on my hands, right? Like I knew better than anybody else. And I have caused harm because I worked on these vaccines and I didn't say anything. Right. So that's what this is all about. 
and doing no harm, informing the people that I worked on this product and that it is harmful and that you shouldn't be putting it into your body. Right. Long story short. But um, so I took the I, I resigned and then I immediately applied to work as a contractor, as an undercover journalist for PDV. And, you know, I, I wanted to look at them essentially, you know, I wanted to work with them. Like they were very friendly with me. They were encouraging me to apply. And, you know, there was no guarantee that I was going to get accepted, but I mean, I basically walked in there and they hired me, um, after an interview and said, you know, let's go, let's get you trained. Let's, let's teach you how, teach you the ropes. Right. So, um, my first ever operation, you want to call it investigation was, you know, we did these Philly drop boxes, went to Philadelphia, learned how to do surveillance and everything, but that's not even in the film, but, um, basically, um, what I started doing, right. As an undercover journalist, you have to literally like use an alias, right? So, you know, my name's Justin, but I didn't tell anybody my name was Justin, right? I, I used, you know, you could say Jason or Jordan or Joe or David or Mike or whatever, right? Like literally came up with all of these aliases that I, that I would use, right? On these undercover dates, right? And so, you know, not all of my meetings were, you know, quote unquote, queer gay dates, but a majority of them were, right? So, I think I think we should I think we should back up a bit and just contextualize this for people because um, some people might be wondering. Hang on a minute, dates? What? Um, so you let's just go we go back one step and we explain slow down. what was happening. Like what was the idea here and what you were actually doing? Because you were still you were working undercover, um, and you were, I remember from watching the film that you were um, finding people. Some of these people were on things like Tinder and. You yes. ar arrange these meetings with them, like you see, all, kind of setting up a honeypot, right? Like it's it, absolutely a honeypot is what I was. I was a right. male honeypot, right? Yeah. So that's a lot of you know in undercover journalism, the most important thing is access, right, to people, right? That you 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 obviously need access in order to obtain information from people, right? You know, like you can't like. For example, just with my Pfizer story, I was such a great source because I had access to all of these people, right? That these people did not ultimately. Mm -hmm. right? So as an undercover journalist, your job is ultimately to gain access in, a, in some way, shape or form, right? Whether it's with an undercover meeting, being a honeypot date, right? Or going to conferences, right? Or going to just bump into somebody on the street you're gonna need an alias of some sort and you're gonna need some way to be friends with this person right mm -hmm. so to me it's you know the the dating apps right that are you know widely used by a lot of people nowadays right like that's how a lot of people like find friends even and find their actual you know husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends right like it's it's crazy how that has exploded over the last 10 years right so that's what my job was to create dating apps right i didn't do it literally right away it happened like a month or so in but once i started swiping i saw how drastic it was that it had to essentially be like these gay guys right because the ratio of men to women that were liking me liking me that were considered subjects right based off of job title right was like 600 to one type stuff it like it was drastic brennan like absurd how many gay guys were liking me on all apps combined versus women right, right. so it was a little demoralizing i'm like wow <laughs> like this is crazy right like i literally had everyone you know there's a setting where you can have men women or everyone so i even had transgender people liking me and you know dude we're, as a journalist like you literally have to like look into everybody right so i mean 
it it's you know as funny as it is right like i i would like message with these people to find out if they're drag queen and that if they're like reading books to kids type stuff right like uh -huh, right right so you're working <laughs> this, is, this is quite broad like you're not just focused on the the pfizer and the pharmaceutical thing you're also doing it's a little bit more broad you're doing other other sorts of um tasks and jobs as projects projects as well, well that's an interesting question because <laughs> my take on my aliases was always like with an alias you want to be able to speak to something that you're comfortable with right you don't want to like i didn't want to use an alias on like i don't know some job that i know nothing about right i mm -hmm. essentially said i was in like pharmaceutical sales and i could just bs that and be like oh i was just hired for like three months ago and you know, I don't really know much. So yeah, tell me all about your life. <laughs> right. Is, you know, just the short end of it. Yeah. Right. So I always had my aliases. I mean, literally, like, here's even a business card of one of this, like this guy, Jordan. Ooh. Right. Um, did you did you like sort of come up with like a, a, a list or a short list of, of people you wanted to target for, you know, conversations? We don't use the word target. These people sure. were subjects, right? Where, subjects, okay, yes. I mean, where there was a system essentially that we all used. To, we were all essentially unique in how we found our subjects, right? But um, all I really was looking for is job title, right? And then once you see the job title, right? If it's like if someone's saying that they work for Facebook, right? Openly on this app, they're probably going to have a huge mouth and talk all bad stuff about Facebook, right? So, you know, whether it was Facebook, whether it was Pfizer, whoever, right? I I wasn't specifically looking for Pfizer, but since I had worked for Pfizer, I was obviously on a Pfizer beat, right? Mm -hmm. So I was looking for Pfizer people to yeah. sit down in front of and get a story on them, right? So I, you know, we can get to Jordan Walker in a little bit, but um, I'll introduce the story about funeral fun um funeral fun was a investigation uh that myself and a senior journalist went to tennessee to a funeral directors conference right so there were a lot of people involved with the funeral uh how do we put it the funeral economy or the funeral world you know like just people all involved with funerals and bombers, funeral directors, you name it, right? So myself in the UCJ that I was working with, uh, he was a senior and we had pictures of blood clots, right? F that came from a source who was an embalmer for over 10 years, right? So not some just dude who's been cutting people up and for a year or two and is starting to ask questions. Somebody who's extremely credible, right? And so this was in 2022, right? We were asking all of these embalmers, all of these funeral directors that were part of the Tennessee funeral directors, like association, what's going on with these clots and people like, you know, trying to get information out of them. And I didn't really get anything great. Right. But, um, you know, it, it, didn't work out in Tennessee, right? But the fact that we had these clots, right, from an embalmer was very, very uh, interesting, you know? And so the same journalist I was working with went to another conference and he did obtain some footage that felt releasable. I didn't save that footage. So, you know, this is just by word of mouth, but, you know, that footage didn't see the light of day. And uh, the pv board of directors um months after the investigation essentially said that you know we don't want to publish this information because it's too conspiratorial essentially and you know this isn't newsworthy content basically right so you know that just had me questioning a lot of things because hey i was coming from pfizer and i'm seeing all this stuff about myocarditis blood clots all these neurological disorders and these vaccines that like look like worms essentially are just coming out of people the these embalmers are cutting people open and pulling out three foot clots like what's going on and why are we not gonna at least raise questions 
right? That's that's my thought process. So um it was pretty pretty crazy. Um so there was funeral fun and then uh even before the Jordan Walker story was uh this story on Ed Camp Long Island where I um you know showed up as a master student and uh started going to these professional development sessions and the first one was called um pronouns bathrooms and flags basically and this professional development group was all about like you know introducing people on how to you know practice affirmations with kids and you know do pronouns and things of all that nature like with this lgbtq ad agenda right and it just was pretty crazy because i ended up meeting another subject there was Alyssa waters and then dave casamento i met dave in this session and um you know i i met with him twice outside of this uh investigation uh or you know outside of the school right and and he told me that his sexuality essentially had a you know lot to do with how he like created connections with kids right and so that was a really powerful thing to say as an assistant superintendent and so that one was a huge one and there was even a parent who like freaked out at the you know there was a huge uproar uh from this story ultimately mm -hmm. once it was released in march of 2021 after there was this lgbtq teach session of an ed camp where it literally was a whole professional development day centered around lgbtq and like accepting all of this stuff so the first ed camp session i went to back in october had just like one of these type sessions basically right and i was looking for content in regards to dei to diversity equity inclusion um in all the other sessions and then i find out in march five months six months later that they have this entire session right and it, every every professional development session was ran by a, a student a teacher somebody who was in charge of you know practicing this way of you know dei essentially right yeah so um i don't want to talk too too much more about that but there was there was some really interesting moments in that uh, around that in the in your in your film man um you know the david casamento stuff you got on you got him saying this on camera um stuff that just would make the the skin of any parent crawl um yeah. you know and it's so damning they just completely wreck themselves um you know you just fed them fed them enough rope and they they hung themselves um but the david casamento thing was was interesting was there any more um you know you feel like is connected to that you want to mention at all before before we get into the next bit well yeah i mean that whole story literally i mean i wasn't even ready to go into this investigation like i didn't have an alias or anything ready but it was just given to me like when i got there from my colleague you know he said oh your name's dave like let's let's roll you know show up as you know this bisexual guy and at this point in time, I haven't touched on this yet in the interview, but I pierced my ears literally to be come across as more effeminate, right? So I pierced them both. And then after like a month, I took this one out and I kind of just rocked the one ear. And like, I, I was demoralized by these earrings ultimately, like in my real life. And, you know, the fact that I had to wear this for my job, I, you know, I didn't have to, but I did it because it just felt necessary, right? to become a more effeminate person. Um, but yeah, speaking on Ed Camp specifically, I mean, it, you know, self-described from like people at PV, it's, you know, coming from a more conservative leaning area too in Long Island, there's like 60, 40 is the percentage of, um, you know, conservatives basically. So this was an area that we knew like, would have impact if this stuff was ultimately going on we received a tip on it and we just went and investigated and you know we did nothing wrong these people said what they said and 
that's that, you know? So the fact that there was such a huge reaction from the parents at East Meadow was really rewarding. And then Alyssa Waters is at Jericho. And then uh, Manhasset is where this guy, Don Gately, was at. And, you know, all I was just, I patted myself on the back because it was a, you know, investigation well done, it seemed. And, you know, Dave, unfortunately, you know, got reassigned and retired. And, um, you know, he said what he said, right? And I didn't put those words in his mouth, right? He told me all those things, you know, so... Um, yeah, so that whole investigation actually happened like with the Jordan Walker story happening in between. So that happened in around October for Ed Camp. And then I got introduced to Jordan Walker, um, by the Bumble dating app. Right. So my, uh, colleague slash work friend, Carrot is his code name, Carrot Top. Uh, he found Jordan Walker in Queens in, in that area, right? So, you know, he got swiped on, I think, by Jordan, right? So with Bumble, you can literally share a profile with somebody, right? So I thought, hey, uh, how how cool is that? He found a subject for me and he's going to send them to me because – I mean, everyone that I was working with knew that I came from working at Pfizer too, right? Like I was known as the Pfizer insider who became an undercover journalist at PV, right? So, um, Carrot shares this profile and we hit it off, right? I liked him, right? Or swiped on him. He swiped back on me and, you know, hit it off in the text messages, exchanged a uh, phone number with him. And then we went to you know a restaurant right for our first place to meet and i really didn't say much to him at first about much of anything i just was rolling with an alias and i knew he was going to be a good subject coming from pfizer so i really didn't want to like scare the you know what out of him initially like oh like these vaccines are killing people da, 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 right like and I mean, if it was just me versus like dealing with a filter almost of the under, you know, for the company that I was working with, I probably would have had different conversation with the man. But I basically was reserved for the first 40 minutes and then work came up. And then, you know, I asked the inf infamous question that went viral. So Pfizer's ultimately thinking about mutating COVID. And then Jordan goes, well, that's not what we say to the public, no. And then he goes on to explain how, you know, they're working on some, you know, they're doing some, like, mutations with monkeys and things like that, right? With no evidence, right? Like, no evidence whatsoever, right? Just coming from his mouth, right? And, I mean, yes, we did OSINT, which is called Open Source Intelligence, right? To make sure that this guy is who he says he is, right? And, you know, I found his LinkedIn page, it said he worked for Pfizer, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's very interesting to see that people after this came out, like this guy, George Webb has written an article essentially that Jordan Walker, like might essentially be a plant almost, you know? So I'm not saying that's true. I'm not affirming that. Right. But I'm a critical thinker and I, you know, literally question everything at this point, you know? So who knows? Right. But so Jordan Walker, I, I had about a, like a little three or four minute cut down from my first meeting, where it was essentially just him talking about Pfizer mutating COVID a little bit. And then I went on another meeting with him, right, to kind of hammer him with this information, right, which is where he goes on to explain more about the menstrual cycles that was also in a second release, right, and goes on to explain how, you know, the F FDA and Pfizer were in bed with one another essentially he we we talked about briefly about scott gottlieb who is he he what came from pfizer and then became the or it was vice versa i think he went from fda to pfizer right, right. and it's just he they called it he called it a revolving door essentially of corruption right and yeah. said that this is bad for the public right so the story itself you know 
I did the journalism. He said those things to me, right? So in real time, you know, I'm like proud of myself. Like, oh, wow, he said all this great stuff to me. But I also knew that Pfizer's mutating COVID was going to pretty much explode on the internet, like before it was even released. I just didn't know how big. And I also was conscious to the terrain model at this point in time, you know, like it took me a little while, not a, not that long to get to the conclusion of viruses aren't real and don't cause disease. But, you know, that moment in time to me was more of like a gradual occurrence of like, you know, it's not like one specific moment yeah. in time where I can point to, but yeah, it was yeah. kind of around the time of you know meeting james and then like leaving pfizer like in between there i was kind of just like questioning 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 yeah you know so which which puts you at odds with a lot of those types of people as well like even if um james wasn't controlled opposition a lot of those people who are well-known faces in the alternative media are very much on that bandwagon where they're pushing the gain of function nonsense and the virus stuff and and just not going to the deeper levels of actually dismantling the whole thing. Yeah, agreed. Which I mean, don't get me wrong, the story definitely like woke people up in a sense to pharmaceutical corruption, right? Yeah. Like boom, bombshell, James O'Keefe, Project Veritas, Pfizer's mutating COVID. Like it literally like woke up my brother. Mm -hmm my father, right, like, to some corruption that goes on in the big pharma realm. Like, yeah, everyone so, needs an entry point, right? Everyone needs that something that gets them in. Yes, but also you and I are you know, the critical thinkers, and it's like, once you hear this story, it's like, dude, this this story is dangerous, right? It literally, in my mind, was dangerous because it's reaffirming at a subconscious level on a massive, massive, like, you know, Glo you know i don't like to say global but like a global scale right of this thing went and saw 50 million views within a few weeks it reached japan it reached germany it reached russia china all over people literally were like redoing skits of like james sitting down with jordan right and we call it an si surprise interview so jordan stands up and is like Right. Like yeah. what is going on, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and like he broke James's iPad and it, that went viral too, you know, like the whole story itself just blew up, you know, out a bigger proportion than I even imagined, you know? And so, you know, me being me, me knowing about terrain, it was like really hard on me because like, I just didn't even know what to do or say because I'm like, I'm being manipulated and like, this is my story. But like James is like dancing around saying that Pfizer's mutating COVID like with no evidence. And, you know, it just, it screamed that there was like some higher agenda still, you know, like, like he would never interview me. Right. But he'll let me go on an undercover meeting. Mm -hmm. Right with a quote unquote Pfizer director, even though, you know, he calls him a Pfizer executive, right? That's something that also gets misconstrued is that this person was an executive level person, which is like vice presidents, right? He was, he was reporting to a, a vice president. Mm -hmm. So under that, um, and it just, it, it didn't sit right with me, you know? Like I was, yeah, I was proud of myself. Like I got a big story, you know, bigger than I could even imagine. It's literally like they were literally saying the biggest story ever, right? Is, is what people were saying like on this Twitter spaces, right? And it just, it broke my heart because I knew that terrain was the model that is true versus germ theory, you know, and to hear Robert Malone on my story talking about gain of function narratives and just reaffirming all of it on a subconscious level to me was like, it, it was bad. You know, I'm like, this is not my integral divine axis, right? This is way off of it, right? Shifted off of it. And I know that this is wrong. Mm. 
-hmm. you know, whether these people know that it's wrong or not, I know it's wrong, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I stayed at Project Veritas for a few more months, right? So this was released in January of 2023, right? January 5th is the official release date. And they followed up with the fertility story a week later. And then the whole, I don't want to, you know, affirm the term charade, but it, what happened with the PV board and James leaving was very suspicious, mm -hmm. right? This whole thing did feel like it was almost coordinated, right? Because like this whole Pfizer story brought up James even saying that like, oh, we can make money off of this. We could get thousands of subscriptions and et cetera, et cetera. Just talking about money when I was worried about like the genocide that ultimately was happening from Pfizer, like this vaccine was still going into a ton of arms, right? It was only 2023, right? I mean, a lot of people have stopped, but it's just, you know, more breaking of the heart type stuff you know, where it just doesn't sit right. And so um, for my train of thought, um, the whole James leaving PV and dealing with this letter that had to do with the board and then Dan Strack, the COO, right? like the whole thing kind of just felt like almost coordinated in a sense. Um, you know, and in real time, it just, it that's what it felt like. And I can't prove any of that, you know, yeah. I really can't, but it just, you know, from my opinion, it felt like it was this charade in a sense of, you know, people are lying about certain things and, you know, James essentially just left on his own, but people say he was fired or vice versa, you know, like no one really knows what happened. Like James did this big speech that, you know, went viral on YouTube, Tim Cast broke it and he talks even about me in regards to the Pfizer story. He says a board member called him to his home. The board member was saying, oh, you had nothing to do with the Pfizer story, James. And then he's like, well, yes, I did. I recruited this person, remember, over dinner, right, for hours, right, which was a lie. He literally was there for 40 minutes, get a bowl of soup, recruited me, and left. Yeah, yeah, that and that part in the, in the in the film, like there's you, you you've got the footage of it where he's saying, you know, into a microphone, I had to talk this guy down off a ledge, and we were there the for hours. And I was, ledge. Like he was like he was there for hours trying to do you a solid kind of thing, um, which is just complete nonsense. Yes, on one hundred percent. I mean, because it's also a lie. He was there for less than an hour, right? And and. He, yeah, I mean, they talked me down a proverbial ledge, but it, like, I wasn't on a ledge. It was like they were on a ledge that, like, I, you know, I said, hey, like, here's this massive story, <laughs> like, publish it, right? And, you know, it's just, you know, this crazy, crazy misconstrued thing, right? Where, you know, I wasn't talked off a proverbial ledge. I mean, the the ledge that would have happened would have been me essentially just blowing the whistle without the evidence that I essentially had to reobtain, right? right. So, um, with the Jordan Walker story is where this whole thing flipped upside down, right? In regards to like getting my story back, right? Five days after is about when I actually got some footage back with uh, the Conwall Gill lady. And, and uh, can I just interject very quickly? Um, when you, you talk about getting your story back, people are like, might be wondering why, because you had been feeding, you've been giving all of your data and information to Project Veritas, and they were keeping it, you know, wherever they were keeping it. But it wasn't, it was no longer in your hands. And then uh, there was a point in time where you no longer had access to it and you essentially almost had to re- redo the whole investigation, reinvent the whole thing kind of. Yeah. So that's a pretty good way to put it, Brennan. But yes, um, I gave them everything. You know, I was too trustworthy and I was naive, right? I was, I, I was like, dude, I don't need to save this, right? I mean, I, 
I had my own laptop, but like it was full with, it was already full with other crap on it. So I was like, all right, I'm just, you know, I'm giving it to these people, you know? And I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a lot, it's a long story, but like, I didn't have a hard drive to put this information on. I was not tech savvy at the time. And, you know, it kind of bit me in the butt because if I did save it, then I would have just had it myself. Right. But I didn't, you know, I was way too trustworthy, you know? So um, yeah, that's essentially what I had to do is play quid pro quo in the sense. And that means like, you got to give them something to get something back. Right. Well, I had to give them this massive Pfizer story, directed evolution with Jordan Walker, right. That was a bombshell, right. James's best story ever, right. Project Veritas's most well-known story in order to get this information back. Right. And I didn't ask for it. It kind of just popped up out of nowhere, you know, where, boom, I got an AAR one day. AAR stands for after action report of a cut down from footage on, you know, the inside of, you know, my former employer, Pfizer. And I screen recorded it and kept it and said, holy, you know what? I was like, God is good. <laughs> I was like, how did I, how did this happen? And it was just a miracle, literally. Um, my, my, my colleague who was working with me on the inside had sent it to me and I saved it. And I said, okay, it exists, right? Like it's real, you know? And I looked at, looked at it, watched it. And you know, what's cut into the documentary is, I mean, I have a full length version that I can also release, but um, it's really powerful what my manager was saying. And so, you know, I just, I got it and I was like, okay, I have something, but I need more. Right. And that wasn't for like greedy purposes or anything, but like, there's gotta be more, you know, there's something else, you know? So I didn't really obtain anything from PV, uh, like in regards to footage still after that, um, but when I did get this footage, I wanted to corroborate, like, where else is this information, right? So right before I knew that I was going to leave, right, because I knew I was going to leave at some point, once James resigned, I basically said, I need to go take a job with James if I'm offered a job because I need access to him to continue the corroboration of this story ultimately, you know, so once I knew the job offer was basically on the table, right, and I knew that I was going to resign, it was just a matter of pulling the trigger on these certain things, right? So I sat down with uh, one of the producers who was at the Microscope Expose, right, and his name is Mike Villani, and um, there was also Jazz, codenamed Jazz, Michael Juarez, who is the PV Source Insider, uh department head basically and they both knew what i was doing 100 percent on the inside right they knew everything basically i mean not as good as the journalists that were specifically working with me but they were in the know like Villani was a producer who cut down the nine hour footage of a to z of lab to the apartment where we looked at all of the stuff Right. So I elicited information out of him essentially at a bar and he started talking about how he took that footage after my story off of the server and put it onto a terabyte drive or a hard drive of some sorts that was in the hands of outside counsel. Right. So I got Volani saying that and Jazz was you know, Jazz is a quiet guy and he was kind of just nodding in agreement and, you know, saying that, you know, this, this stuff was real. And I even asked Falani, like, dude, imagine if my insider story story was released or, you know, whatever it was that I elicited him on in, in the doc. But he's like, dude, don't even get me started. Cause like anecdotally, Valani told me that like what I was doing at, Pfizer was literally his favorite story ever, right? He's like, it's it's awesome. It's freaking awesome is essentially what he's put into into words. 
right? So I was on, you know, done with Volani. I called Volani right before I resigned, essentially. And then I called Dan and explained, uh, or I, I started off asking him actually where this hard drive was. I was like, where is it? <laughs> where's where's <laughs> all your information that you'd been feeding them for months? Yeah, exactly. I was like, just where is it? I want to know where it is. Uh, that's all I really had to ask the guy. And he's like, uh, legal as it. I'm like, okay, inside or outside counsel. And then he goes, uh, outside. Why? I'm like, oh, well, uh, I just want to know basically. And oh, by the way, I'm resigning. Um, so, you know, I go to OMG literally like the next day or two. Right. And I actually obtained more information that following day. Right. Um, and, and OMG is O'Keefe Media Group for anyone who's yeah. not already familiar. Yes. So um, when I leave and go to O'Keefe Media Group, OMG, I obtained uh, the Ramin footage. And um, I was, again, like, God is good. This is crazy. You know, like, how did this just fall into my lap? So, you know, I made sure that I got that as well as there were uh, some transcripts uh that i obtained and you know that was all that i needed at that point i was like okay i have a story now like i got my footage got some of my footage back right and so in in the corroboration of everything you know i mean there's a conversation where i have with nightingale talking about the nick warren information of gaming the fda and you know even my conversation with Volani spiked Nightingale to bring up how this whole terabyte conversation even happened. And I was able to corroborate that, you know, I, I just was on a mission at that point and it was, you know, maybe stupid in a sense, right. To do this. But I, I felt that there was an injustice done to me and thus an injustice done to the world to not let this information out there you know regardless of whether i get attacked or not you know it's it's i i had to remove you know i don't want to use the word karma but it felt karmic in a sense of like you know what was happening you knew the harm that was this was causing to people so you have to do something about it and i really tried super super hard right but absolutely you did yeah <laughs> You know, so, it, you know, everything happens for a reason. So, um, yeah, um, where are we in the story? Um, yeah, so, I mean, there was, there was, um, you know, the, the blood clots. And then, I mean, I also got uh, the, we showed the vials with, like, granulations uh, from a source who I left anonymous. Uh, they had sent that information, actually, um, where... You know, they were basically just saying these granulations are coming from people that are vaccinated and like non-vaccinated blood doesn't exactly look like this. So I've looked into it and it is a thing. It's just less common, I think, than these blood clots. Um, but ultimately, it all really just goes back to this, these drug delivery patents, essentially, that are out there. Right. And have the same ingredients as um, these vaccines. Right. These quote unquote vaccines. Right. And, you know, I'll even, you know, in a, in like I've seen um, or I haven't seen the episode on the end of COVID, but I'm friendly with Amanda Volmer and she and I had a conversation where, you know, even though that there is this drug delivery system essentially being, you know, patented and put into people. Right. The human body is brilliant and is really good at basically making sure that this stuff doesn't actually happen or come to fruition. Right not saying it can't happen in certain people, right? People can manifest this thing even, you know, even if you didn't take the injection potentially, right? Like, but that's not to say don't take the toxic poison, right? Um, so that's one of the things that, you know, you never saw the, the you know, the blood clots and then the granulations. And then um, we just discussed the hard drive, Um I had to corroborate that as best that I could. Um, oh, and to and it, uh, elaborate even more on the hard drive, there was an article that was published by the Connecticut Sentinel, which was published after I resigned. 
right from working at omg so we're we're jumping ahead a little bit in regards to all of this but the context fits where this article um basically says that james o'keefe had evidence that big pharma you know higher ups were talking badly about vaccine efficacy and safety right which back in 2021 would have been an incredible story right to come out with this type of information right the vaccine hesitancy on a massive global scale would have went through the roof like at least 20 percent, probably like 80 or 100 whatever estimation there is i don't know because it didn't happen the way it i i imagined it right mm -hmm. Um, but in, in this article, James O'Keefe essentially talks, uh, to a board member who apparently is the source who provided these communications to this journalistic, uh, you know, company, Connecticut Sentinel saying that, you know, there's this, um, he goes anything in M yet says this board member and M stands for my code name microscope. Right. And James basically sent him a five minute cut down, said that there's this newsworthy content and the board member goes on to say, wow, just like what I've been saying that this stuff is, you know, there's, there's no research into this essentially. And there's, you know, all these side effects that are happening and from, from the mouths of these high up people in pharma. Right. And then James response to that was the risk is high to publish. Right. And that was November 28th. And then he met me like, what, three days later, four days later on the third, right? Or five days later, right? To tell me that we're not telling your story. So it was just, it was, you know, back to that, it was super heartbreaking. And, um, you know, I just, it, it's, it, it's horrible that this has played out the way it has, but, um, you know, so back to I'm going through the script a little bit so I don't lose all my train of thought. But yeah, left PV to OMG and I started working there. Same same type of role as an undercover journalist. But like we were all wearing different hats um, where I was more of a source manager too, right? Like I was fielding tips, fielding information from sources where at project veritas i really didn't deal with sources right i didn't i wasn't reading the pv tip line and going through james's twitter and things of that nature so i had more access at omg which was definitely a blessing right because it led me to the other whistleblowers that are part of this documentary which we can get to now um so in May of 2023 is when I met Kim Witzak, who is a whistleblower and she's been a whistleblower for a while, but her story is not like publicly known and she had more essentially to share than what was public. And, you know, she just wanted to draw attention to uh, these documents and, you know, has this really gut-wrenching heart-wrenching story right so i flew to minneapolis to meet kim and she has mountains of documents basically so i was just chilling with her at her house like taking scanning all of these documents and putting them in just putting them into my phone you know and she was she and i were talking about you know pharma corruption and everything and she got to her whistleblower story of how Chantix, uh, which is a smoking cessation drug, had a black box warning on it um, for years, right? I forget the exact year that I was given a black box warning, but for those who don't know, a black box warning is essentially like just this huge red marker on um, a drug label that basically says, you know, caution, this has these types of side effects, you know, watch out for violent tendencies, suicide, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like whatever horrible side effects would come from it had to be labeled, right? So in 2016, for the first time ever, there was an FDA 
uh, hearing or approval meeting to remove the black box warning from Chantix. It's not like the formulation changed or anything, right? It was literally just, oh, we're going to remove this because it's not necessary, right? And so Kim was on the committee that was supposed to vote for this, and she was taken off of it hmm. for this vote and this vote alone. So it's very sus, right? Because she would have voted no and hmm. and potentially gotten other people to vote no, right? But so she went to this meeting anyways. She flew out to, I think it was in DC, right? And had this huge video to show people. And there were a ton of people who were affected by Chantix uh, there as well, whether it's being, you know, domestic violence from the drugs, suicides, et cetera, et cetera, right? The, it, it was a drug that had an impact on a lot of people's lives. So, you know, unfortunately, there was no success with this, uh, you know, video being shown and everything. The drug had the black box warning removed. First time ever that has happened with a drug, right? And... Within two years, Pfizer made nearly like a billion dollars in, in I believe, revenue for Chantix, right? So it went from black box warning to blockbuster drug, right? And it's just this money game of of pharma, right? Kind of like a, in, in the film, Conwall, my manager goes, yeah, I think it's turning into a money game, right? And so, you know, this is just another prime example of how these companies don't have anybody's best interests in mind, right? They could care less about warning you about these side effects. They just want you to take their drugs so that you're hooked in that, oh, you know, you might be committing violence against your loved one or your your kids, for example. So Kim has, has this absolutely, you know, gut-wrenching story. And I mean, it even stems from, she calls herself an accidental activist or advocate, Right. Where she lost her husband, Woody, to um, he was taking a drug of uh, it was it wasn't Prozac. Zoloft? Um, it was. Yeah, it was Zoloft. Right. So he took Zoloft and there's this 60 day window within the clinical trials that highlights that Zoloft is supposed to, you know, you're supposed to be like monitored within the 60 day window. And um Woody was prescribed this off label too, right? He took it for um, insomnia and like some anxiety related issues, right? So it's very conflicting, right? And so Kim ended up suing Pfizer because like they literally knew that this drug was causing violent tendencies. And even, I mean, she talks about akathasia, right? Which mm -hmm. is like, your body is shaking, right? And it's like you have no control over it, right? You can't stop. So like this is something that a lot of people have to deal with and it's something that leads to killing yourself ultimately, right? Like people shaking uncontrollably, right? Just out of, you know, like I'm and not making fun of it. No, no, and it's not just the shaking too. It's like sensations of like burning on the inside, like this yeah. itch that they can't get rid of. Like it drives them absolutely. Like the suffering is so extreme that, like you said, there's the solution is, you know, sometimes they get in such a, a hole with a black hole that they, you know, that's the only seeming, seemingly the only solution. And you you actually highlighted that in the, in the documentary as well, I remember. Yeah. And one of these people uh, in the system, I can't remember who it was now, you probably remember, actually said that, oh, you know, someone in this situation, you know, hey, maybe death is a you know, welcome solution, you know? That's the kind of way they treated it. Yeah. So when Kim heard that, she's like, my husband's dead because of this. How do you, like, explain yourself? You know, so she just had this gut-wrenching story, and I got back from Minneapolis, right? I was super excited, I was like, James should interview her, right? Like, we don't even need to, like, you know, all it really needs to be done is a professional interview, right? And so, you know, my colleagues were like, oh, no, like, that's not necessarily how we work. Like, and so literally I was sent to, like, a psychotropic pharmacologic drug conference to try and elicit this information out of 
professionals, right? Like medical professionals. And, you know, I even had a subject list of people that were involved with her story. Um, but I was just one guy and I was dealing with citizen journalists around me, right? Citizen journalists in a sense of, I mean, there was one lady who I worked with, I'll leave nameless, but she knew what she was doing, right? With, with what was going on, right? She, she knew how to elicit information out of people, right? But the thing with these, the citizen journalist thing going on within O'Keefe Media Group is that it seems like it's this business model that is not necessarily sustainable, but I mean, we'll see, you know, I mean, if they can keep, you know, if James is able to do it, by all means, go ahead. But it just, as a trained and seasoned undercover journalist at that time, you know, all of us at OMG were just wondering, like, why is James so dead set on this citizen journalism business model when, like, it takes up a ton of our time, a ton of our money, and it's not proven, you know, like, we... It, it was it was a it was a headache for sure you know so um i went to that conference didn't obtain any information and then you know basically i stayed in touch with kim but it you know it's not like we were texting every day or anything like we just stayed in touch and i basically said hey it seems like they you know don't really want to interview you like they don't want to release your story so she interviewed with uh the journalistic company redacted um, I forget the guy's name, but Kim did a great interview with him, like 40 minutes. And, you know, she got to tell her story finally. But, you know, I wanted to tell her story like, what, nine, 10 months prior. So, you know, it just it it was, again, like gut wrenching. And I mean, I even resigned after that point, right, when she got to tell her story. But, you know, I'm I'm very happy that Kim got to tell her story. And I'm sure that um, you know, she knows kind of what I've been up to at this point and uh, is is a supporter, you know, of of what I'm ultimately doing. So um, Kim's story was one of the whistleblower stories. And then there's another one, Raymond Bachard, who Raymond has this really interesting story on Twitter uh, or X, if we want to call it X now. Um, so the background behind ray is that he wrote this book called the berlin turnpike and he's exposed a lot of uh human child trafficking rings um berlin turnpike is is his you know big big heavy hitter because it's his book but he also has successfully um done what he essentially presented to james uh with facebook slash meta Right back oh, yeah. in 2012, he got 400,000 signatures on a petition, and like 1.2 million people followed the movement to the point where Mark Zuckerberg essentially had to address this problem of like pornography. And then it's more than just pornography; it's it's the search engine aspect of being able to take certain search terms and plug it into these social media platforms and anything and everything really can come up with when there's no age verification system in place. Right. So it was really a simple fix with Facebook, you know, Ray did this petition and it successfully got the attention of Mark Zuckerberg and it did well, like within a year, it was like up to par kind of with what you would expect. Right. Um, and it's just a simple fix. Like they use a Microsoft age verification face scanner, essentially that can essentially just catch whether somebody is 12 or looks like they're 18. Right. So getting to the Twitter part, I, you know, met with Ray, um, in person before I even, you know, brought him to James, um, and heard out his story and he he starts showing me all of this you know information of like this you know essentially child pornography the pornography and then how it can be used in as as a as a predator essentially right where you take all these search terms and you take the search filter off of twitter right where 
anything can essentially show up and then you can start typing in like non-con which means non-consensual or like hashtag rape kink right hashtag nude teen which you know there are way worse ones that you can even type in but those are just examples and so ray has this story essentially called clean twitter now right where he is you know you could pull up his twitter profile he's literally calling out twitter for um this this childhood abuse system essentially right and so i brought raymond to uh talk to james right and um this was after even hearing from my colleagues uh jasper and nightingale that this was a story right like they were like this is great you know like james should interview with him so i literally drove with ray you know an hour to new jersey to interview with james in person right and james really um was conflicted before the interview um he was essentially concerned about optics apparently with twitter and you know how he has a he has a friendship with elon musk apparently and you know that's documented on the internet just from you know him tweeting about elon commenting on his stories right always makes that known right so i knew that there could be some conflict of interest in james's mind but i wanted to see what would happen ultimately right and so raymond affirms that there is probably zero chance that elon musk does not know about this information right because these you know these links can be shared and you know twitter is potentially making millions if not billions of dollars off of this right and some of these accounts are thousands tens of thousands even some of them have like hundreds of thousands of followers from sharing child pornography right and some of the links like linked to chatterbait or other streaming devices or platforms that you know abuse happens potentially right where it's just this open source search engine at this point and it it's where predators could essentially find their next victim like a seven-year-old can make a twitter account and change these search settings and then boom they're subject to all of these predators so um it's also lined out in the interview with james that they are clearly um breaking twitter's own policies as well right especially the non-consensual one like there are, are pictures of you know women with like guns to their head and then you know they're doing the thing right of you know getting on their you know they're they're you know it's it's essentially a non-consensual whether, whether it's acting or not it's like really subject to being questioned right so raymond has this really powerful story as well um considering nightingale and jasper also saw it as a story but then james said there was no smoking gun of any substance and that he wants to avoid talking about this sort of stuff in general it just didn't sit right with me again you know it's like hey this to anybody with like common sense it feels like that this is a massive story actually you know and raymond it also is also very credible right it's not like he's just some dude who's mm -hmm. doing this. he's like he's a human rights advocate right yeah. and he's you know bringing this information to me and i work for you so i'm gonna bring it to you what do you think oh nothing okay all right just another check on on the stick of this doesn't feel right ultimately mm -hmm. so yeah we can stop talking about raymond and his brilliant story but um and then i mean that's where we kind of lead into um you know the whole bohemian grove thing Ultimately. Right, yeah. Yeah, I really wanted to get to this because I don't recall it being mentioned in the version of the doco that I've got. Um, so I wanted to ask you about this and maybe we can, maybe we can, from Bohemian Grover, can kind of like, you know, wrap it up and put a bow tie on it and then we'll, we'll sure. switch it if we have time. If you can hang around for maybe another 10, 15, we'll see if we've got any uh, questions from our Truth Vesting yeah, members. Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions if they're, I, I mean... I don't really know how to look into. Oh no, you're right, man. I'll I'll check on that. That's all good. Um, cool. But yeah, so yeah, going to that side of it. 
This concludes part one of the show. You'll find part two and related materials in my members-only portal, The Truthiversity, the consciousness-raising university. This creation is the official home for all my multimedia research and entertainment content. Updated regularly, my members get access to absolutely everything I create, including full podcasts, videos, blogs, courses, audio files, live internal events, the whole enchilada. Grab yourself a free 24-hour pass at access.truthiversity.com.